Olá a todos. Uh, hello, everybody. Recebemos hoje no Instituto de Estudos Avançados a professora Laura Sonter, que falará sobre ameaças da mineração à biodiversidade uh, no sentido de uh, atender a futura demanda de bens minerais devido à transição energética. Uh, Dr. Laura Sonter will speak about mining threats to biodiversity in terms of meeting the needs of the energy transition. Uh, estamos uh, contentes de recebê-la no Instituto de Estudos Avançados, a professora Laura Sontra, professora de gestão ambiental na Universidade de Queensland, na Austrália. Ela atua na Escola de Ciências Ambientais e da Terra e é vice-diretora do Centro de Biodiversidade e Ciências da Conservação. Uh, Dr. Laura Sunter is a lecturer of environmental management at the University of Queensland in Australia. Uh, she works at the School of Environmental and Earth Science, Earth Science and is a deputy director of the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation Science. Um, a presença da doutora Laura Sonta uh, está ligada à sua participação em um projeto financiado pela FAPESP. Um, the participation of Dr. Laura Sonta is linked to uh, her participation in a project, a research project, financed by the São Paulo Research Foundation. Uh, we start soon. Uh, welcome, Laura. Uh, I would say the floor is yours, but I should say the screen is yours. So thank you. Excellent. Hi, everyone. Let me just um, share my screen very quickly and we will get started. Luis, can you just confirm that you can see that? Yes, yeah, so we can see the screen. And it's in full presenter mode? Yes, it's perfect. Great. Excellent. Okay, and I'm going to turn my camera off so I'm not just speaking to myself the whole time, which is weird. Okay, Louise, feel free to shout out if something goes wrong with the presentation throughout as well. But um, I say, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak to you all today um, uh, and for such a warm welcome, Louise. I wish I could be there with you all in person, hopefully someday soon. Uh, as Louise said, my name is Laura Sonta. I'm a senior lecturer in environmental management at UQ School of Earth and Environmental Sciences and um, recently deputy director for education at UQ Centre for Biodiversity and Conservation Science. Okay, oops. Okay, so my talk today is broadly about this topic of mining and conservation, which is a topic I've been working on for almost a decade now and all started with my PhD research, which was based um, in this region, the Iron Quadrangle in Minas Gerais. I'm sure many of you know this region is Brazil's largest producer of iron ore and also incredibly biodiverse. It contains hundreds of plant species, many of which are endemic and dependent on the region's iron-rich rocky outcrops. So my talk will draw from the experiences that I've had over the past 10 years or so, but it will be roughly divided into three, three parts. First, we'll talk about current mining threats to biodiversity and global conservation goals and why managing these threats can be such a challenge. Next, we'll talk about the minerals that are needed to fuel a green energy transition and what mining those materials might mean for biodiversity. And third, we'll talk about whether current conservation approaches, specifically biodiversity offsetting, can effectively mitigate mining threats to biodiversity. But let's start with the current state of biodiversity, which has been in decline for over the past 50 years, largely due to human use and modification of natural ecosystems. So this is a human footprint map, which shows the extent of human pressures on ecosystems and that wild and intact places, so the places shown in green, no longer dominate the planet. Um, big global assessments like the IPBES reports document the effects of these changes on biodiversity. So ecological communities have lost more than 20% of their biodiversity. A million species of plants and animals are now threatened with extinction. 
These losses not only reduce the benefits that people receive from nature, but also threaten future generations' quality of life. And so in response, the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, alongside the Convention on Biological Diversity's Global Biodiversity Framework, lay out a really ambitious conservation agenda that's increasingly focused on recovering biodiversity and securing its benefits for people. So I argue that the mining sector has a key role to play in this conservation agenda, and I think there are many reasons for this. One is that mineral resources exist in all significant biodiversity areas around the world, and in many instances, the conservation community just can't achieve biodiversity goals without engaging the sector. The problem is that very few examples of good biodiversity outcomes exist in mining regions, and I think it's interesting to think about why that might be the case. <clears throat> so on the one side, we have the mining sector who understand the importance of biodiversity and the business risks associated with causing harm to it. We have industry groups, financial institutions and certification standards that are all committed to mitigating biodiversity losses from mining. And many are even aiming higher now to achieve a net positive impact on nature. But the problem is that mining companies often lack the tools that are needed to understand threats early enough to make changes in a project's scope and to operationalise corporate commitments at a meaningful site scale. In contrast, we have the conservation community who have really effectively identified the key biodiversity areas for conservation needed to achieve global um, biodiversity goals and increasingly use planning tools to prioritise conservation investment um, that, and at documenting past impacts of development and the effectiveness of those conservation um, investments. The problem is that reports like this one that are produced by um, the World Bank and other um, Forum for an International and other conservation organisations really don't um, point out the full range of links between mining and conservation, nor do they proactively identify where and how um, mining threats may um, occur to biodiversity in the future. The other problem is that the um, Convention on Biological Diversity's post-2020 conservation agenda makes no mention at all of mining and minerals, which is really concerning to me because mining threats are so different than those caused by other land uses. So just how does mining threaten biodiversity? Well, this figure shows the current state of our knowledge. It relates the causal pathways that link mining to biodiversity um, along the, the y-axis across different spatial scales on the x. And the colours on this graph show where most research has been done to date. And darker colours equal more work. What you can see is that most research is focused on the direct effects of mineral extraction. So clearing for mineral, um, clearing for mineral ex habitat clearing for mineral extraction and site infrastructure establishment um, and rehabilitating those areas post-mining. However, we also know that mining indirectly affects biodiversity, for example, by creating demand for mineral processing or transportation needs or by affecting access to surrounding um, lands land, for surrounding land users um, and other external stakeholders to utilise natural ecosystems. We also know that these impacts on biodiversity can occur across a range of spatial and temporal scales, um, here in this graph, again, we see that most research has occurred within the area um, being leased for mining, um, and fewer studies have uh, looked at regional to global scale consequences um, for biodiversity happening further abro abroad outside the mining lands. <clears throat> So I think a major reason um, why so much work has focused on site scale impacts of mining relates to this um, misconception that mining has a relatively small scale impact on biodiversity. The, um, the conception is that mines take up a small 
um, area much smaller than other threatening processes. And so they're not always deserving of our attention at the global scale, at least. And I suppose that's somewhat true, but until very recently, we really didn't have good data on the global spatial footprint of mining activities. Luckily, there's some very excellent mapping work being produced by colleagues in Australia um, and in Austria, which highlight both the uneven distribution of, of mining worldwide and that in some places, mining can have quite a large spatial footprint. But what I think is even more interesting than the spatial extent of these direct impacts and whether they're smaller or larger than other threats is the acute long-term consequences that mining projects can have on some specific species and ecosystems, particularly when those biota have evolved with their underlying geology. So the photograph on this slide is of um, grassland ecosystem in Brazil that many of you are probably familiar with called Kanga, which is um, a biodiverse um, vegetation community restricted to the iron-rich rocky outcrops um, throughout the, your country's major iron mining regions. Um, years ago, I developed some land use change models to project mine expansion across the iron quadrangle in Minas Gerais and measure the consequences that mining would have for ecosystems like Kenga. What we found was that while mining cleared much less vegetation than other land users would over the next 20 to 30 years, alone the mining sector would destroy more than a third of this ecosystem. So I think this highlights the need to look beyond the extent of impacts and consequences of a single mining project and to better understand the mining threats to specific biota. The other thing is that we also know mines don't operate in isolation from the regions in which they occur, but instead they interact with other sectors and local communities in ways that also indirectly affect biodiversity. So a few years ago, we tested the extent of these indirect impacts of mining on forests. We focused on large-scale mines across the Brazilian Amazon, and we compared deforestation rates between areas surrounding the mine sites and areas far from any mining activities. And we used statistical matching methods to control for all of the other factors that influence whether forests are cleared or not in the Amazon. What we found was that deforestation rates were higher than expected, up to 70 kilometres from the boundaries of mining leases. And if we add up these differences in impact, what we found is that we could attribute 10% of all forest loss in the Amazon to the mining sector, which isn't an insignificant amount. Okay, so we're starting to get a handle of all the diverse ways through which mining currently threatens biodiversity, although they are still overlooked in the global biodiversity conservation agenda. But what about future mining threats? Will they differ from current threats? And should we avoid them all when some conservation goals actually require minerals to be achieved? So one trend that may drive changes in mining threats is related to a green energy transition. So a switch from fossil fuels to renewable sources of energy is necessary to mitigate climate change and, among many other things, avert any associated biodiversity losses. The problem is um, that renewable energy technologies and infrastructure are incredibly material intensive and increasing their supply will require huge production increases in many minerals and metals. Current projections, as you can see here on um, this graph on the slide, suggest that um, meeting international climate commitments of limiting warming to less than 2 degrees Celsius will require about 3.1 billion tonnes of new material by 2050. And this is a huge increase above the no climate action baseline that you can see. What's also evident is that growth in mineral demand will be uneven. The sun minerals will experience significant growth, such as lithium and cobalt highlighted on this, um, in this table. 
whereas others will grow less but have enormous amount absolute demand. So, for example, we'll need about 103 million tonnes of aluminium and 29 million tonnes of copper just to produce the solar panels and wind turbines needed for a green energy transition. So this increased and shifted mineral demand will not only drive more mining, it will also drive more mining in new places. And we were really interested in what the potential consequences of that might be for biodiversity. So to answer that question, we needed to first map the areas potentially influenced by different types of mining. Um, we took mine locations from a big global database, um, SMP database, which shows more than 60,000 mining properties currently in pre-operational, operational and closed stages of mining. We then separated those properties into those that target energy transition minerals, so ETM, those that are needed for wind and solar power and energy storage technologies. Um, and we did that using this World Bank report versus those that, that don't. So things like fossil fuels and fertilisers. We then mapped the areas that were potentially influenced by mining um, for each commodity type, these two commodity types. Um, and we did that by converting mine properties to a one kilometer grid cell, grid cells, and mapping the 50 kilometer area around each of these cells to capture the off-site and indirect threats of mining to biodiversity. It's important to note that there are huge uncertainties in selecting this buffer distance. Um, so we repeated our analysis for a 10 kilometer buffer as well, and found that all of our results held. But I think it's very important to say that a lot more work needs to be done on this topic to really determine how these off-site impacts, the extent of them, differ among commodities, mining types and places. The other thing that we did was to map mine density, um, this, this indicator that we called mine density, um, to determine the severity of mining threats. Well, we assumed that more mines in a location meant greater threats to biodiversity. So this is another big assumption of our analysis that requires more work. Um, but what we did was we summed up the number of mines that we found within 50 kilometres of each one kilometre grid cell. So here is our map of areas potentially influenced by mining. The blue shades are the areas with mines targeting um, energy transition minerals. Orange shades contain mining properties that target other materials, fossil fuels, fertilisers, and purple shades contain mining properties that target both types of commodities. Obviously, there's a huge difference in the extent of um, mapped mining areas depending on the buffer width that we use to capture off-site threats to biodiversity. Um, but you can see that there's a difference in the spatial distribution of threats among these two commodity groups. So next, we took our mining areas and we overlaid them with areas of known importance for biodiversity conservation to do two things. First, we wanted to investigate overall mining threats to biodiversity and then to examine the differences in threats that occur between these two different types of commodity groups. We looked at um, three types of conservation priorities, currently protected areas, key biodiversity areas, which aren't currently protected formally, but are considered vital for achieving global conservation goals, and um, wilderness areas, this, this indicator of last of the wild, which don't have any formal protection yet, but are seen as, a, um, as potential sites for proactive conservation initiatives. Um, you can, so you can see there is some overlap among these priorities, but there are also large differences. In terms of mining threats to biodiversity, we found the proportional overlap with these um, three types of conservation sites was lower for mining areas than non-mining areas. And this potentially suggests that conservation areas protect against mining threats, although almost 10% of mining areas did co-occur 
with formerly protected areas, which um, is a lot. Alternatively, it suggests that these conservation sites aren't threatened by mining, which may be the case for wilderness. It's wild because mining hasn't occurred there yet. Or they may have been downsized or sited away from mineral-rich areas. And there is some anecdotal evidence that that occurs for protected areas. In terms of the mining threats from energy transition minerals, we found that the proportional overlap um, with conservation priorities was not different between mining areas that targeted energy transition minerals compared to the mining areas that targeted other commodities. However, we did find some differences in terms of this indicator of mine density or threat severity. So mining areas that overlapped protected areas were significantly more dense, so they had more mines per 50 kilometres for um, those areas that targeted energy transition minerals compared to those targeting other commodities. So taken together, our results suggest that expanding mining areas globally will threaten biodiversity conservation priorities regardless of the commodity type, but that increasing the proportion of mines that target materials needed for renewable energy production may also disproportionately increase threats to biodiversity within currently protected areas at least. So I guess this is a bit of a cautionary tale. Um, Despite climate change mitigation being a shared goal, um, uh, including it being important to conservation, um, the conservation agenda, delivering on it may create new tensions between mining companies and conservation organisations. Um, but our results are, are, are rough. They're a rough first step and there are lots of uncertainties left to address before we can really understand and plan for these new mining threats to biodiversity. So there are two main steps that we're, um, my research group is engaged in right now. Um, and here's a bit of a taste of those. The first is to take a deeper dive into the mining threats to specific species. So similar to our previous analysis, we've taken our mining maps and overlaid them with the known habitat ex extent for more than 5,000 mammal species. This is really preliminary, but our analysis suggests that more than 130 species have 30% or more of their habitat overlapping with mining areas. And I think that's what's really interesting about these results is that many of these species are considered to be data deficient. And so we don't know enough about them yet to manage them properly. Um, I think this represents a really excellent opportunity for mining companies to contribute to information about species in the regions in which they're operating. The second piece um, of work that we're doing is to focus in on the Australian context. Um, our country is really rich in many of these energy transition minerals and our federal government is positioning us at the moment to become a world leading supplier of these materials. So what we're doing is to work to understand which species in our country may um, coexist with the locations of new mines um, and understand where the knowledge gaps currently are in terms of limiting um, our ability to properly manage, manage the long-term um, trajectory of those species. Okay, so mining threats to biodiversity are unlikely to go away in the future, and it's reasonable to suspect that in some places they may actually grow. The third thing I want to talk about today is whether current conservation approaches can effectively mitigate future threats um, or impacts of mining on biodiversity. I'm going to focus on um, biodiversity offsets, which are conservation interventions aimed at increasing biodiversity in, in one place to compensate for biodiversity losses elsewhere. The goal of offsetting is to achieve a no net loss or increasingly a net gain um, in biodiversity. So biodiversity offsetting is a super common approach um, to biodiversity management in the mining sector. 
industry requires them in a lot of cases and there's a lot of guidance on how to implement them according to the mitigation hierarchy, which means that they should be um, used as a last resort to managing impacts on biodiversity, but we'll talk more about that later. In addition to industry standards, governments are also implementing offsetting policies um, and we see offsets required in an increasing number of countries around the world. So offsetting is happening all over the world and we have some guidance on how to mitigate and um, uh, to offset biodiversity losses. The next obvious question is, are they actually working? So in 2019, a colleague of mine, Sofa Sum Garson, and his colleagues conducted a global analysis of offsetting policies and projects to answer this question. The authors reviewed more than 15,000 papers in the scientific literature and found only 32 examples of offset projects that had actually been evaluated. So this means that the body of evidence on offsetting success or failure is really small, which in itself is worrying given that thousands of projects have been implemented worldwide already. The other thing that they found is that of these 32 projects, less than a third reported achieving their goal of no net loss. And those that did focus on one type of ecosystem, so wetlands generally in North America, and use measures of success that have been highly criticised in the literature. So, for example, they focused on the area of offsetting that had been done rather than the biodiversity that had been created by that project. So this is a problem, right? On the one hand, we're seeing huge numbers of offsetting projects happening all around the world to achieve no net loss of biodiversity in response to growing needs for development. But on the other side, we have very little evidence that these projects actually succeed in practice. <clears throat> so why do some policies fail while others seemingly succeed? As we saw in the previous slide, we, we just don't have very good data to answer that question yet. But the other thing is that many factors complicate efforts that do seek to answer that question. Firstly, offsetting policies and projects vary enormously in their design and implementation making it really difficult to compare outcomes among them. So, for example, here are two common but very different approaches to generating biodiversity gains. Improvement approaches seek to restore habitat on degraded land, whereas averted loss approaches protect threatened habitat um, and avert its future loss. Secondly, local conditions can have a huge influence on the biodiversity gains generated by compensation activities, even for identical policies. So, for example, revegetation may be more successful in generating biodiversity in places surrounded by well-functioning ecosystems, which help processes of natural regeneration. So what I'm going to do now is to talk a bit about a recent study that um, we did to understand how these two factors, policy design and local conditions, influence policy success or failure, a task that I think is enormously important to understand in order to learn from the past and do better in the future. Okay, so for this study, we investigated eight hypothetical compensation policy options representing um, two combinations of uh, or two approaches to generating biodiversity gains, um, improvement approaches using revegetation and averted loss by establishing new protected areas, and four methods for trading biodiversity between the sites of development where it was lost and the sites of compensation where it will be gained. Um, these were out-of-kind trades where the biodiversity that was gained by compensation doesn't need to be of the same kind or type as that loss to development, in kind, where it does need to be the same kind or type, and trading up, where the biodiversity gained at the compensation site must be of higher conservation priority, either being more rare or more at risk of being lost. We investigated these policy options across four case studies, which um, differed considerably in their local conditions, including current levels of biodiversity and relative pressures from different types of development. 
So, for example, in um, the Brigalow Belt in Australia, we focused in on um, development impacts from coal mining activities. In the Iron Quadrangle in Brazil, we focused on iron mining. So for each of our case studies, we developed a suite of simulation models. And I don't want to go into the details of this, but basically we use these models to do three things. First, we simulated future development scenarios across each case study and determined the compensation that would be required under each policy option. Second, we quantified changes in biodiversity due to development and compensation activities using vegetation extent as our proxy and measuring changes relative to a counterfactual scenario of what would have happened in the absence of development and um, any offsetting. Third, we determined policy performance um, of compensation policies, which we um, defined as how close policies came to achieving no net loss of biodiversity. So, for example, if the development caused um, this level of biodiversity loss that's indicated by the black bar on this graph and compensation policies or offsetting policies achieved the biodiversity gains represented by the coloured bars, we would conclude that the green policy achieved no net loss um, because the gains exceed the losses. And although the blue didn't because it falls below that dotted, dotted line, it did perform better than the orange policy. Okay, so some results. We found that none of the policies that we investigated achieved no net loss of biodiversity. And this was true across all four case studies that we looked at. Here are the results for one of these case studies, the Brigalow Belt in Australia. The dashed black line on this graph shows the amount of vegetation lost to coal mining um, projects. And the coloured bars show the biodiversity gains made by compensation or offsetting policies, where the colours match those in the wheel that we, um, that we talked about before. So no policy achieved no net loss of biodiversity. The coloured bars here on the graph don't meet the dash black line, but you can see that some policies performed better than others. In this example, the type of trade in biodiversity between the development site and the compensation site affected the performance considerably. For averted loss approaches, the largest gains were made when trading up to protect vegetation most at risk of being lost. So the additional gains um, shown in this burnt orange colour. We also found that local conditions explain some differences in policy performance among um, our case study sites. So one condition um, that was really important was related to land availability. In some cases, we ran out of land, um, ran out of unprotected uh, vegetation to protect for averted loss approaches, and we ran out of cleared land to revegetate for improvement approaches. And this in turn limited um, our model's ability to implement the policy. For example, in the Brigalow Belt, so the graph on the left of the slide, um, land was not a huge constraint on um, being able to implement um, this policy. We didn't run out of cleared areas in our model to revegetate. However, in East Kalimantan, the graph on the right of the slide, we did run out of land to revegetate. And the model ran out pretty quickly, resulting in improvement approaches performing about half as well as they did in the Brigalow Belt. <clears throat> so one of the big take-home messages from this study is that achieving no net loss um, of biodiversity with offsets will require a lot of compensation. You need to have um, a very large multiplier, so to protect a lot more land than you lost to development in order to be able to achieve that no net loss, and sometimes orders of magnitude more than current policies require. The other thing is that it's really difficult to know how much is needed for protection in advance um, before these scenarios play out. Um, <clears throat> so we need to do lots, lots of comp comp 
conservation activities and regardless of whether it's protecting at-risk sites or restoring degraded ecosystems, it's going to require a lot of land and sometimes more than is available. One option that's discussed in the literature to address this problem um, to reduce the amount of land needed for um, biodiversity offsetting is to better apply the mitigation hierarchy that I mentioned before to avoid or minimise as much biodiversity loss from development um, is as possible so that less is needed for offsetting. However, I, th I think this is a really difficult um, or big challenge in the context of mining minerals needed to mitigate climate change. Um, so one piece of work that we're hoping to do next really seeks to understand when it's absolutely critical to avoid biodiversity impacts of mining. The plan is to predict where new mines will occur across the world, quantify their impacts on species habitat, and evaluate whether offsetting opportunities exist for those species. When they don't, and any loss would push that species or ecosystem below some critical threshold, we would recommend that it would be that it should be avoided and offsetting not be put on the table. Um, and I think having that information is vital to simultaneously achieving sustainable development goals alongside um, the global conservation agenda and managing trade-offs that may occur between those different objectives. So I think I'm going to leave it there. And I just wanted to, to finish up by acknowledging um, some of the, the people who were involved with many of the different studies that I talked about this morning. A lot of the, the mining um, maps and analysis that I talked about was done in collaboration with UQ Sustainable Minerals Institute. The um, work on biodiversity offsetting was a part of a much broader project um, uh, funded through the Science for Nature and People Partnership. Um, and lots of the, the ideas and the next steps that um, we're, we're thinking about doing in terms of this research is in collaboration with my research group and others in UQ Centre for Biodiversity and Conservation Science. Um, but thank you. Thank you, Laura. I'm happy to take questions as they come through. Uh, so thank you for your um, explanation and presentation. Uh, we have um, a couple of questions. Great. And yes, I would start by um, well, one of the things that you mentioned and that raised questions is uh, you mentioned that uh, there is a misconception in terms of the impacts of mining, direct impacts of mining on biodiversity. So the question is uh, related to uh, how, um, <clears throat> how does mining affect uh, areas? Uh, you mentioned that, uh, for example, in your Amazonian study that could uh, affect it area could be could reach up to 70 kilometers from mine sites oh, so the, the 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 demand that question is for you to explain a little bit more on uh, what would be this process how does mining affect areas outside the mine footprint yeah it's a great question um so i think one of the biggest drivers um is related to uh required infrastructure to uh, access the site for mining and to transport the mined material from site to um, either processing plants or to a, a port for export. Um, and so building new roads um, itself may have, you know, a pretty small footprint as well but establishing new roads um, creates enormous pressures on the surrounding landscape because it provides access to um, other land users to come in and to utilise that land. So I think we see this sort of flow on effect from um, building access to the site and then bringing in a workforce and transporting out um, the mined materials. So I think that's a way um, 
that's a really important way that we see those indirect impacts emerging um, at a regional scale potentially. And we have done lots of work on that in Brazil and a little bit in Australia, but I think that there is a really great opportunity to try to quantify those indirect impacts from other types of mining in other parts of the world because there's a risk of um, taking these numbers that we're producing from Brazil and from the Amazon and applying them elsewhere when they don't, they may not, um, they may not uh, be representative of the local context. So I think there's a lot more work to be done in that space. Thank you. Uh, there's another question uh, related to one common um, point of discussion in the mining community in Brazil that is related to the comparative footprint of mine and other activities. You did a study in the Iron Quadrangle. Um, there are uh, some studies or uh, at least some claims that in terms of uh, especially forest conservation in that area, remaining forests, um, the Iron Quadrangle ranks uh, quite in a quite good position in, relate, uh, in relation to um, the extent of natural vegetation and not other parts of the Minas Gerais state. Yeah. And uh, uh, so some people say there is a potential contribution or an actual contribution of mining companies in securing uh, biodiversity, even if we, of course, need to acknowledge that mining directly and, as you say, indirectly affects uh, biodiversity values. Um, so could you develop a little bit on the role or the potential role of mining in uh, also contributing to some level of uh, biodiversity protection? Yes. Yeah, it's a great point. I agree with it um, really strongly. And I try to argue this a lot of the time. There's a big opportunity for um, mining companies to contribute towards biodiversity conservation goals. I think um, I think that the question the questioner is right. There's a um, there's a lot of work that these companies do to establish or to maintain um, biodiversity in their regions, and I think there's also a lot of biodiversity that remains on a mine site. Um, you don't mine the whole lease; quite a lot of the lease is left and potentially containing um, important species. And I think um, that was one of the reasons behind us doing that analysis that I mentioned halfway through the talk of looking at the spatial overlap between mining operations and species habitat was to figure out what do we know that co-occurs and what are the big gaps in data. Um, yes, mining industry can make a big contribution in terms of protecting some of those species habitats, but I think another enormous contribution could be in terms of providing the data needed to fill gaps in our knowledge to ensure that those threatened species that do occur in those locations, which are often pretty remote and hard to access, um, are filled so that we don't need to double up on, on research effort that mining companies are often doing anyway. So I think if we can open up communication between the mining sector and the conservation community just a little bit more to figure out exactly what the scale of conservation activities that these companies are doing and where there are opportunities for them to fill gaps. Um, I think that would go a long way, both in terms of um, biodiversity conservation outcomes, but uh, helping to create more of a transparent contribution as well and um, maybe help overcome some of the scepticism that a lot of the conservation efforts that mining companies do do um, is more related to, um, you know, managing business risks and um, corporate uh, perceptions of sustainability. Thank you. Um, a third point is... Uh, specifically uh, addressing uh, in terms of addressing uh, biodiversity offsets. 
Um, it's uh, often said, at least by uh, some people, that uh, when you are trading, when you are uh, offsetting or trying to offset, there is a time lag that should be considered. Specifically, you, uh, what you are going to lose is immediate or in the short term, and the potential uh, benefits, the potential gains, uh, are either spread over a long time frame or will only be um, <coughs> actually uh, an outcome in the long term. How could uh, mining companies uh, that uh, are intending to sometimes, as you know, so mining companies have voluntary commitments in terms to the in terms of biodiversity, and maybe this trend is uh, growing. But some currently, some mining companies do have those uh, voluntary uh, commitments. And how, what, would, what kind of advice would you have for those companies in terms of uh, best practice of planning and implementing uh, biodiversity offsets? It's a good question. I think that um, the time lag is, is a really important risk. Um, so is all of the other uncertainties in being able to generate um, biodiversity gains that are equivalent to those that are being lost. Um, one way to do it is to generate the biodiversity gains before anything is lost, which um, is maybe an option for some companies with um, a lot of capital and long-term strategy. Um, but I think that would be limited to a handful of mining companies globally that have the capability to undertake enormous conservation efforts prior to um, obtaining approval potentially to mine and remove, um, uh, you know, biodiversity that needs to be offset. Um, I think bringing in, um, you know, the, the other alternative to that is, is kind of adaptive management and constantly um, assessing the development of an offset and how much biodiversity gains it's um, accruing over time and starting those processes early is better than starting them later. Something else um, that has been documented in the offsetting literature is that um, rarely are offsets monitored in the long term. So we know there's a time lag that makes logical sense, but we don't know exactly how well they're doing, what that time lag always looks like um, and what is being done when things don't go according to plan. So I think um, bringing offset planning into uh, mine planning um, early as possible in the process is, is a good way to reduce uncertainties um, that time lags and other things that might cause um uh may jeopardize the outcomes of an offset project um yeah to minimize them um and there's a lot of guidance on that available for companies um to use to show all of the different options that companies have to reduce the risks that their offsets will fail but i think monitoring is key and having the capability to um uh update and modify what you're doing in response to what's being monitored is really important. Well, thank you. Yeah. There's still another question. Um, yeah. uh, it's, you mentioned that um, if, uh, we need to increase the supply of minerals, in particular uh, the so-called critical minerals, in order to meet the needs of the energy transition and uh, to reach our both goals in terms of uh, fighting climate change and uh, curbing biodiversity erosion. Uh, and uh, you, in particular, studied offsets. And the question is uh, in terms of uh, other kinds, uh, other types of strategies that uh, are available or should be available uh, to avoid the pressure of mining, um, considering the, the, the increased demand of, uh, of minerals 
Yeah. Uh, so I think um, the strategy of figuring out where which species might be at risk from developing these minerals um, will enable uh, conservation organisations and other stakeholders outside of the mining industry to um, invest in those places to either protect them or to at least build our knowledge base on how they um, respond to or can recover potentially post-mining. I think um, really getting ahead of that game will be important by improving our understanding. Um, and then I think, you know, applying the mitigation hierarchy is always important um, and thinking carefully through um, you know, not just the most um, uh, easiest to access mineral um, uh, or bodies for these for, to supply these um, these uh, energy transition mineral um, demand that we will have, but um, to maybe think more strategically about are there options to um, uh minimize biodiversity impacts of extracting some of those materials by targeting other ore bodies um altogether that don't co-occur with already threatened species or species that may become threatened if um we mine all of the lithium from one part of the world for example um i also think the the challenge with the a green energy transition is that the material, the mineral demand that will be needed is so dependent on the technologies that um, we end up choosing to, to mitigate climate change. Um, the amount of materials that we need fluctuates, as does the types of materials that we need. And so better understanding um, not just those, con those um, consequences for mining, but how that translates to biodiversity consequences, to carbon emissions associated with extracting those minerals um, and bringing that into decision making around what's the best pathway for us to mitigate climate change um, I think I think is an enormous challenge but something that would um, go a long way to getting us ahead of that game and not trying to have to offset biodiversity impacts all of the time but being able to think about biodiversity early enough in the process to be able to effectively avoid it without also missing out on mitigating climate change. Well, thank you. Uh, I think we could use our final five minutes or less than that to a final, um, your, to hear your reflections on one uh, to some extent, uh, uh, old conflict in terms of uh, mining and biodiversity protection, but uh, that's still around and maybe could uh, increase in coming years as the pressure to extract more minerals and um, biodiversity uh, well-conserved areas are also under pressure from uh, many other development drivers. And that's the issue of uh, protected areas. Uh, in some countries, uh, mining or oil extraction is allowed inside, inside some categories of protected areas. In other countries, and that's the case of Brazil for most uh, types of protected areas, mining is not allowed. Uh, but there has always been uh, discussion and the pressure sometimes grows uh, stronger, and other times not that strong. But that's still uh, one point of, uh, of discussion and of possible development or further development in terms of mining. Some companies, uh, for example, in Canada, they use the term land access. Um, Mining companies say they should have more land access, at least to identify mineral deposits. And uh, many of them, you know well, overlap with areas that are important for biodiversity. Um, what's the way uh, forward? Is it possible uh, to... <clears throat> 
allow some room, more space for mining to develop over some types of protected areas? Or should it be the other way around as the biodiversity crisis is uh, so um, important these days and so yeah. uh, important to, to address that quickly? Yeah. Uh, basically, you understood what are the, the points of the the discussion that is so on the table in several parts of the world now. Yes, I feel that's, <laughs> I feel like you're setting me up there. I think that's a really difficult question to answer. And I think that it's going to be case by case. And I think that it's um, really risky to uh, go in one direction or the other with like a blanket statement. Um, I know that um, you know, industry bodies are increasingly committed to avoiding protected areas. Um, the ICMM, the International Council on Mining and Metals, um, say that member companies should avoid World Heritage areas and should respect um, legal designation of, of um, protected areas in the countries in which they operate. But some certification schemes are going even further and are suggesting uh, complete avoidance of, um, you know, IUCN protected area categories one to five, um, which is beyond, in a lot of cases, what countries require. Um, and so I can see that big <laughs> sweeping commitments like that um, can really cause a lot more tension um, between conservation and mining. And I think that's a problem when we start to think about all of the conservation goals that require minerals to be achieved, like climate change mitigation. Um, I also think that it limits the ability to, for mining companies to be able to invest in helping to manage protected areas in some parts of the world. We know that setting up a protected area um, itself isn't always sufficient um, to reduce pressures and alleviate um, or conserve effectively biodiversity. And in a lot of cases, mining companies are um, providing resources and knowledge and capability to ensure that the protected areas that are there are managed well. So, um, <clears throat> and then we don't want to, min you know, we don't want to um, put in place uh, requirements that, disincentivize nations expanding protected areas because they're concerned that they won't be able to access the resources that exist in those places. So I think it's it needs to be a more nuanced discussion around um, what are the impacts um, of these mining operations that are in protected areas um, and are they, uh, like, are there alternatives? Can we... Um, what are the actual, what do those impacts actually mean? Are they at odds with the, um, the, the um, key objectives of the protected area? Um, and we need to do a better job of assessing impacts pre-mining and putting in place mitigation and compensation um, activities to overcome them and then monitoring them in a transparent way to ensure that... Um, you know, we're not allowing one thing and then something else completely different happens. So I think there's no easy answer to that. I think, you know, um, even committing to more uh, stringent regulations around mining and protected areas, I'm not sure, will have the, have the good biodiversity outcomes always that we hope they will. Um, I think it's more about collaboration Um and co-management of these places. Thank you. Um, we are exactly at um, eight, so we use it fully. Use it our uh, one hour uh, for this uh, presentation and discussion. Um, Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Louise, for organising, and everyone else who was involved in putting this together. It was fantastic to be able to connect with you all and I'm really looking forward to the next time I'm able to visit Brazil. Thanks very much and um, 
I, I'm sure that everyone that uh, watched uh, this uh, presentation liked it very much and it will be available in the website of the Institute of Advanced Studies. Uh, well, for a long time, uh, anyone can come back or uh, those who could not attend today will be able to have a glimpse of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And please reach out if anyone has other questions or would like to discuss any of these issues further. Feel free to send me an email. I'm always happy to chat about these topics. Obrigado, então, a participação de todos que assistiram. Os dados da Laura estão disponíveis no website do Instituto de Estudos Avançados. Até uma próxima oportunidade, então.